United Airlines Flight 93 was a domestic scheduled passenger flight that was hijacked by four Al-Qaeda terrorists on board, as part of the September 11 attacks. It crashed into a field in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, during an attempt by the passengers and crew to regain control. All 44 people on board were killed, including the four hijackers, but no one on the ground was injured. The aircraft involved, a Boeing 757-222, was flying United Airlines daily scheduled morning flight from Newark International Airport in New Jersey to San Francisco International Airport in California. The hijackers stormed the aircraft's cockpit 46 minutes after takeoff. The pilot and first officer took measures, such as deactivating the autopilot, to hinder the hijackers. Zia Jera, who had trained as a pilot, took control of the aircraft and diverted it back toward the East Coast, in the direction of Washington, D.C. College Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin al Sheib, considered principal instigators of the attacks, have claimed that the intended target was the Capitol building. After the hijackers took control of the plane, several passengers and flight attendants learned from phone calls that suicide attacks had already been made by hijacked airliners on the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon in Arlington County, Virginia. Many of the passengers then attempted to regain control of the aircraft from the hijackers. During the struggle, the plane crashed into a field near a reclaimed strip mine in Stony Creek Township, near Indian Lake and Shanksville, about 65 miles 105 kilometers southeast of Pittsburgh and 130 miles 210 kilometers northwest of Washington, D.C. A few people witnessed the impact from the ground, and news agencies began reporting the event within an hour. Of the four aircraft hijacked on September 11, the others were American Airlines Flight 11, United Airlines Flight 175 and American Airlines Flight 77. United Airlines Flight 93 was the only aircraft that did not reach its hijacker's intended target. Vice President Dick Cheney, in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center deep under the White House, authorized Flight 93 to be shot down. Upon learning of the crash, he is reported to have said, I think an act of heroism just took place on that plane. A temporary memorial was built near the crash site soon after the attacks. Construction of a permanent Flight 93 National Memorial was dedicated on September 10, 2011, and the concrete and glass visitor center situated on a hill overlooking the site was opened exactly four years later. <laughs> <laughs> Hijackers The hijacking of Flight 93 was led by Zia Jera, a member of Al-Qaeda. Jera was born in Lebanon to a wealthy family and had a secular upbringing. He intended to become a pilot and moved to Germany in 1996, enrolling at the University of Greifswald to study German. A year later, he moved to Hamburg and began studying aeronautical engineering at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. In Hamburg, Jera became a devout Muslim and associated with the radical Hamburg cell. In November 1999, Jera left Hamburg for Afghanistan, where he spent three months. While there, he met with al Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden in January 2000. Jera returned to Hamburg at the end of January and in February obtained a new passport containing no stamped records of his travels by reporting his passport as stolen. In May, Jera received a visa from the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, arriving in Florida in June 2000. There, he began taking flying lessons and training in hand to hand combat. Jera maintained contact with his girlfriend in Germany and with his family in Lebanon in the months preceding the attacks. 
This close contact upset Muhammad Atta, the tactical leader of the plot, and Al-Qaeda planners may have considered another operative, Zakaria's Musawi, to replace him if he had backed out, for muscle. Hijackers were trained to storm the cockpit and overpower the crew, and three accompanied Jera on Flight 93. The first, Ahmed al-Nami, arrived in Miami, Florida, on May 28, 2001, on a six-month tourist visa with United Airlines Flight 175 hijackers Hamza al-Ghamdi and Mohand al-Sheri. The second Flight 93 hijacker, Ahmed al Haznawi, arrived in Miami on June 8 with Flight 11 hijacker Whale al Sheri. The third Flight 93 muscle hijacker, Saeed al Ghamdi, arrived in Orlando, Florida, on June 27 with Flight 175 hijacker Fayez Banahamid. On August 3, 2001, an intended fifth hijacker, Muhammad al Qatani, flew into Orlando from Dubai. He was questioned by officials, who were dubious that he could support himself with only $2,800 cash to his name, and suspicious that he intended to become an illegal immigrant as he was using a one-way ticket. He was sent back to Dubai, and subsequently returned to Saudi Arabia. Ziad Jara and Saeed al Ghamdi's passports were recovered from the Flight 93 crash site. Jarrah's family said that he had been an innocent passenger on board the flight. Topic: <inaudible> Flight. The aircraft involved in the hijacking was a Boeing 757 to 222, registration N591UA, delivered to the airline in 1996. The airplane had a capacity of 182 passengers. The September 11 flight carried 37 passengers and 7 crew, a load factor of 20%, considerably below the 52% average Tuesday load factor for Flight 93. The seven crew members were Captain Jason Dahl, First Officer Leroy Homer Jr., and flight attendants Lorraine Bay, Sandra Bradshaw, Wanda Green, C.C. Lyles, and Deborah Welsh. Topic. Boarding The four hijackers checked in for the flight between 7.03 and 7.39 Eastern Time. At 7.03, Gamdi checked in without any luggage while Nami checked in two bags. At 7.24, Hasnawi checked in one bag and at 7.39, Jera checked in without any luggage. Hasnawi was the only hijacker selected for extra scrutiny by the Computer Assisted Passenger Prescreening System CAPS. His checked bag underwent extra screening for explosives, with no extra scrutiny required by CAPS at the passenger security checkpoint. None of the security checkpoint personnel reported anything unusual about the hijackers. Hasnawi and Gamdi boarded the aircraft at 7:39 and sat in first class seats 6B and 3D respectively. Nami boarded 1 minute later and sat in first class seat 3C. Zia Jera called his girlfriend, Isel Sengen, from a public telephone at the airport, repeating the words I love you over and over. He boarded at 7.48 and sat in seat 1B. The aircraft was scheduled to depart at 8 o'clock and pushed back from gate A-17 at 8.01. It remained delayed on the ground until 8.42 because of heavy airport congestion. The three other hijacked flights all departed within 15 minutes of their scheduled times. By the time Flight 93 became airborne, Flight 11 was four minutes away from hitting the North Tower and Flight 175 was being hijacked, Flight 77 was climbing normally and was nine minutes away from being hijacked. 
by 9.02, one minute before Flight 175 hit the South Tower, Flight 93 reached its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet 11, meters. .With the attacks unfolding, air traffic officials began issuing warnings through the Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System ACARS. Ed Ballinger, the United Flight Dispatcher, began sending text cockpit warnings to United Airlines flights at 9.19, 17 minutes after he became aware of Flight 175's impact. Ballinger was responsible for multiple flights, and he sent the message to Flight 93 at 9.23. Ballinger received a routine ACARS message from Flight 93 at 9.21. At 9.22, after learning of the events at the World Trade Center, Leroy Homer's wife, Melody Homer, had an ACARS message sent to her husband in the cockpit asking if he was all right. At 9.24, Flight 93 received Ballinger's ACARS warning. Beware any cockpit intrusion. Two A C aircraft hit World Trade Center. At 9:26, Captain Jason Dahl sent an ACARS message back. Ed, confirm latest MSSGPLZ. Jason. At 9 hours 27 minutes and 25 seconds, the flight crew responded to routine radio traffic from air traffic control. This was the last communication made by the flight crew before the hijacking. <laughs> hijacking The hijacking on Flight 93 began at 9.28. By this time, Flights 11 and 175 had already crashed into the World Trade Center and Flight 77 was within nine minutes of striking the Pentagon. The hijackers on those flights had waited no more than 30 minutes to commandeer the aircraft, most likely striking after the seat belt sign had been turned off and cabin service had begun. It is unknown why the hijackers on Flight 93 waited 46 minutes to begin their assault. At 9 hours 28 minutes and 17 seconds, First Officer Leroy Homer managed to transmit to the ground, shouting, Mayday! Mayday! Get out! over the radio amid sounds of violence. A Cleveland Air Traffic Controller replied, Somebody call Cleveland! but received no reply. 35 seconds after the first Mayday call, the crew made another transmission. Homer shouted, Mayday! Mayday! Get out of here! Mayday! Get out of here! The flight dropped 685 feet 209 meters in half a minute before the hijackers managed to stabilize the aircraft. The exact time at which Flight 93 came under the hijacker's control cannot be determined. Officials believe that at 9.28, the hijackers assaulted the cockpit and moved the passengers to the rear of the plane at the same time to minimize any chance of either the crew or the passengers interfering with the attack. The other hijacked flights were taken by five-man teams, but Flight 93 had only four hijackers, leading to speculation of a possible 20th hijacker. The 9-11 Commission believed that Mohammed al Qatani was the likely candidate for this role, but was unable to participate as he had been denied entry into the United States one month earlier. With many passengers saying in phone calls that they saw only three hijackers, the 9-11 Commission believed Jera remained seated until the crew were overpowered and passengers were moved to the back of the aircraft and then took over the flight controls out of sight of the passengers. The flight recordings revealed that Captain Jason Dahl and First Officer Leroy Homer survived the initial attack and were still alive after the hijackers took over the plane. 
Dahl and Homer took actions to interfere with the hijackers, including disengaging the autopilot just before the hijackers took over in order to prevent them from aiming the plane at Washington, D.C., and switching the output of the pilot's microphones from the cabin address speakers to the radio transmitter so that Jera's attempts to communicate with the passengers would instead be heard by air traffic controllers. Dahl stayed in the cockpit alone with the hijacker pilot, injured but not dead, while Homer was knocked unconscious and dragged from the cockpit. The flight transcript suggests that at least two hijackers were in the cockpit. Zia Jera was identified as the pilot and is heard calling another hijacker, Saeed indicating that Saeed al-Ghamdi, who also trained in flight simulators, was helping Jera with the controls. The cockpit voice recorder began recording the final 30 minutes of Flight 93 at 9 hours 31 minutes and 57 seconds. At this moment, it recorded Jera announcing, Ladies and gentlemen, hear the captain. Please sit down, keep remaining seating. We have a bomb on board. So sit. The controller understood the transmission, but responded. Calling Cleveland Center, you're unreadable. Say again, slowly. The cockpit recording captured Dahl moaning and Jera telling him in English to sit down and to stop touching something, presumably the controls. Jason Dahl's wife, Sandy Dahl, listening to the cockpit voice recorder, commented that Jera was fussing at my husband. He was speaking in English, and he spoke Arabic any time he was talking with the other hijackers. Jason made moaning sounds after that. It sounded like he was trying to mess with stuff or get up, because the hijacker pilot kept telling him to stop and to sit down. A woman, presumably first-class flight attendant Debbie Welsh, is heard being held captive in the background and is heard struggling with the hijackers and pleading. Please, please, don't hurt me. Quote dot. Unable to engage the autopilot, Jera turned the plane and headed east at 9 hours 35 minutes and 9 seconds. The aircraft ascended to 40,700 feet meters and air traffic controllers immediately moved several aircraft out of Flight 93's flight path. The woman in the cockpit is heard to say, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, before being killed or otherwise silenced, followed by one of the hijackers saying in Arabic, Everything is fine. I finished. At 9.39, two minutes after Flight 77 impacted the Pentagon, air traffic controllers overheard Jera say, Ah, here's the captain, I would like you all to remain seated. We have a bomb aboard, and we are going back to the airport, and we have our demands. So please remain quiet. Air traffic controllers did not hear from the flight again. Passengers and crew began making phone calls to officials and family members starting at 9.30 using GTE airphones and mobile phones. Altogether, the passengers and crew made 35 airphone calls and two cell phone calls from the flight. Ten passengers and two crew members were able to connect, providing information to family, friends, and others on the ground. Tom Burnett made several phone calls to his wife beginning at 9 hours 30 minutes and 32 seconds from rows 24 and 25, though he was assigned a seat in row 4. Burnett explained that the plane had been hijacked by men claiming to have a bomb. He also said that a passenger had been stabbed with a knife and that he believed the bomb threat was a ruse to control the passengers. During one of Tom Burnett's calls, his wife informed him of the attacks on the World Trade Center and he replied that the hijackers were talking about crashing this plane. Oh my God! 
It's a suicide mission. Quote, he began asking her for information about the attacks, interrupting her from time to time to tell the others nearby what she was saying. Then he hung up. He ended his last call by saying, Don't worry, we're going to do something. An unknown flight attendant attempted to contact the United Airlines maintenance facility at 9 hours 32 minutes and 29 seconds. The call lasted 9-5 seconds, but was not received as it may have been in queue. Flight attendant Sandra Bradshaw called the maintenance facility at 9 hours 35 minutes and 40 seconds from row 33. She reported the flight had been hijacked by men with knives who were in the cabin and flight deck and had stabbed another flight attendant, possibly Debbie Welsh. Mark Bingham called his mother at 9 hours 37 minutes and 3 seconds from row 25. He reported that the plane had been hijacked by three men who claimed to have a bomb. Jeremy Glick called his wife at 9 hours 37 minutes and 41 seconds from row 27 and told her the flight was hijacked by three dark-skinned men who looked Iranian, wearing red bandanas and wielding knives. Glick remained connected until the end of the flight. He reported that the passengers voted whether to rush the hijackers. The United Air Traffic Control Coordinator for West Coast Flights, Alessandro Sandy Rogers, alerted the Federal Aviation Administration FAA Herndon Command Center in Herndon, Virginia, that Flight 93 was not responding and was off course. A minute later, the transponder was turned off, but the Cleveland controller continued to monitor the flight on primary radar. The Herndon Center relayed information on Flight 93 to FAA headquarters. Joseph DeLuca called his father at 9 hours 43 minutes and 3 seconds from row 26 to inform him the flight had been hijacked. Todd Beamer attempted to call his wife from row 32 at 9 hours 43 minutes and 48 seconds, but was routed to GTE phone operator Lisa D. Jefferson. Beamer told the operator that the flight was hijacked and that two people who he thought were the pilots were on the floor dead or dying. He said one of the hijackers had a red belt with what looked to be a bomb strapped to his waist. When the hijackers veered the plane sharply south, Beamer briefly panicked, exclaiming, We're going down! We're going down! Dahl continued to struggle in the cockpit, refusing to allow a hijacker to engage the autopilot for their target, Washington, D.C. The hijackers were heard to say, Inform them, and tell him to talk to the pilot, bring the pilot back possibly referring to Homer CVR transcripts. A United employee in San Francisco sent an ACARS message to the flight at 9.46. Heard report of incident. PLZ confirm all is normal. Linda Gronlin called her sister, Elsa Strong, at 9 hours 46 minutes and 5 seconds and left her a message saying there were men with a bomb. Flight attendant C.C. Lyles called her husband at 9 hours 47 minutes and 57 seconds and left him a message saying the plane had been hijacked. Marion Britton called her friend, Fred Fumano, at 9 hours 49 minutes and 12 seconds. Fumano recalled, She said, we're gonna. They're gonna kill us, you know, we're gonna die, and I told her, don't worry, they hijacked the plane, they're gonna take you for a ride, you go to their country, and you come back. You stay there for vacation, you don't know what to say. What are you gonna say? I kept on saying the same things, be calm, and she was crying and screaming and yelling. Flight attendant Sandra Bradshaw called her husband at 9 hours 50 minutes and 4 seconds and told him she was heating water to throw at the hijackers. Passenger Lauren Grancolas called her husband twice, once before takeoff and once during the hijacking. 
He missed both of her calls. She then passed her phone to honor Elizabeth Wainio. Wainio called her stepmother at 9 hours 53 minutes and 43 seconds and concluded, four and a half minutes later, by saying, I have to go. They're breaking into the cockpit. I love you. Jera dialed in the VHF omnidirectional range VOR frequency for the VOR navigational aid at Reagan National Airport at 9 hours 55 minutes and 11 seconds to direct the plane toward Washington, D.C. Bradshaw, on the phone with her husband, said, Everyone is running up to first class. I've got to go. Bye. Beamer told Jefferson that the group was planning to jump on the hijackers and fly the plane into the ground before the hijackers' plan could be followed through. Beamer recited the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm with Jefferson, prompting others to join in. Beamer requested of Jefferson, If I don't make it, please call my family and let them know how much I love them. After this, Jefferson heard muffled voices and Beamer answering, Are you ready? Okay. Let's roll. These were Beamer's last words to Jefferson. During the hijacking, Flight 93 passed within 1,000 feet 300 meters instead of the normal 2,000 feet 610 meters of a NASA KC 135 returning from a microgravity flight over Lake Ontario. NASA pilot Dominic Del Rosso recalled how odd the silence on the radio was that morning. Topic. Passenger revolt The passenger revolt on Flight 93 began at 9.57, after the passengers voted on whether to act. By this time, Flight 77 had struck the Pentagon and Flights 11 and 175 had struck the World Trade Center towers. As the revolt began and the hijackers started maneuvering the plane violently, the plane left its Washington, D.C. course. The hijackers in the cockpit became aware of the revolt at 9 hours 57 minutes and 55 seconds, Jera exclaiming, Is there something? A fight? Edward Felt dialed 911 from his cell phone from the rear lavatory of the aircraft seeking information at 9.58. His call was answered by dispatcher John Shaw, and Felt was able to tell him about the hijacking before the call was disconnected. Multiple news reports originally based on a 911 supervisor's account after having overheard the call asserted that Edward Felt reported hearing an explosion and seeing smoke from an undetermined location on the plane. These reports were not corroborated by Shaw or Felt's wife, Sandra, who listened to the recording afterwards. C.C. Lyles called her husband once more from a cell phone and told him the passengers were forcing their way into the cockpit. Jera began to roll the airplane left and right to knock the passengers off balance. He told another hijacker in the cockpit at 9 hours 58 minutes and 57 seconds, seconds before the South Tower collapsed. They want to get in here. Hold, hold from the inside. Hold from the inside. Hold. Jera changed tactics at 9 hours 59 minutes and 52 seconds and pitched the nose of the airplane up and down to disrupt the assault. The cockpit voice recorder captured the sounds of crashing, screaming, and the shattering of glass and plates. Three times in a period of five seconds there were shouts of pain or distress from a hijacker outside the cockpit, suggesting a hijacker that was standing guard outside the cockpit was being attacked by the passengers. Jera stabilized the plane at 10 hours 0 minutes and 3 seconds. Five seconds later, he asked, Is that it? Shall we finish it off? Another hijacker responded, No. Not yet. When they all come, we finish it off. Jera once again pitched the airplane up and down. A passenger in the background cried, In the cockpit. If we don't, we'll die. At 10 hours 0 minutes and 25 seconds. 
16 seconds later, another passenger, yelled, Roll it! possibly referring to using the food cart. The voice recorder captured the sound of the passengers using the food cart as a battering ram against the cockpit door. Jera ceased the violent maneuvers at 10 hours 1 minute and 0 seconds and recited the takbir several times. He then asked another hijacker, Is that it? I mean, shall we put it down? The other hijacker responded, Yes, put it in it, and pull it down. The passengers continued their assault and at 10 hours 2 minutes and 17 seconds, a male passenger said, Turn it up. A second later, a hijacker said, Pull it down. Pull it down. At 10 hours 2 minutes and 33 seconds, Jera was heard to plead, Hey! Hey! And then, Give it to me! Repeated eight times in succession, possibly referring to the plane's yoke, the airplane plummeted into a nosedive with the yoke turned hard to the right. The airplane rolled upside down, and one of the hijackers began shouting the takbir. Among the continued sounds of the passenger counterattack, the aircraft picked up speed, whooshing and shrieking were picked up on the recorder, and the hijackers inside the cockpit are heard yelling, No! over the sound of breaking glass. The final spoken words on the recorder were a calm voice in English instructing, Pull it up! The plane then crashed into an empty field in Stony Creek, Pennsylvania, about 20 minutes flying time from Washington, D.C. The last entry on the voice recorder was made at 10 hours 3 minutes and 9 seconds. The last piece of flight data was recorded at 10 hours 3 minutes and 10 seconds. There is controversy between some family members of the passengers and the investigative officials as to whether the passengers managed to breach the cockpit. The 9-11 Commission report concluded that the hijackers remained at the controls but must have judged that the passengers were only seconds from overcoming them. Many of the passengers' family members, having heard the audio recordings, believe that the passengers breached the cockpit and killed at least one of the hijackers guarding the cockpit door. Some interpreted the audio as suggesting that the passengers and hijackers struggled for control of the yoke. Vice President Dick Cheney, in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center deep under the White House, authorized Flight 93 to be shot down, but upon learning of the crash, is reported to have said, I think an act of heroism just took place on that plane. Topic. Crash At 10 hours 3 minutes and 11 seconds, near Indian Lake and Shanksville, Pennsylvania, the plane crashed into a field near a reclaimed coal strip mine known as the Diamond T Mine owned by PBS Coals in Stony Creek Township in Somerset County. The National Transportation Safety Board reported that the flight impacted at 563 miles per hour, 906 kilometers per hour, 252 meters per second, or 489 knots at a 40 degree nose down inverted attitude. The impact left a crater 8 to 10 feet deep, c. 3 meters, and 30 to 50 feet wide, c. 12 meters. All 44 people on board died. Many media reports and eyewitness accounts said the time of the crash was 10.06 or 10.10. An initial analysis of seismographic data in the area concluded that the crash occurred at 10.06, but the 9-11 Commission report states that this analysis was not definitive and was retracted. Other media outlets and the 9-11 Commission reported the time of impact as 10.03, based on when the flight recorders stopped, analysis of radar data, infrared satellite data, and air traffic control transmissions. Kelly Levernight, a local resident, was watching news of the attacks when she heard the plane. I heard the plane going over and I went out the front door and I saw the plane going down. It was headed toward the school, which panicked me, because all three of my kids were there. 
Then you heard the explosion and felt the blast and saw the fire and smoke." Another witness, Eric Peterson, looked up when he heard the plane. It was low enough, I thought you could probably count the rivets. You could see more of the roof of the plane than you could the belly. It was on its side. There was a great explosion and you could see the flames. It was a massive, massive explosion. Flames and then smoke and then a massive, massive mushroom cloud." Val McClatchy had been watching footage of the attacks when she heard the plane. She saw it briefly, then heard the impact. The crash knocked out the electricity and phones. McClatchy grabbed her camera and took the only known picture of the smoke cloud from the explosion. In September 2011, shortly before the 10th anniversary of the attacks, a video of the rising smoke cloud filmed by Dave Burkibble who had died by 2011 from his yard two and a half miles away from the crash site was published on YouTube. The first responders arrived at the crash site after 10.06. Cleveland Center controllers, unaware the flight had crashed, notified the Northeast Air Defense Sector needs at 10.07 that Flight 93 had a bomb on board and passed the last known position. This call was the first time the military was notified about the flight. Ballinger sent one final ACARS message to Flight 93 at 10.10. Don't divert to D.C not an option," he repeated the message one minute later. The Herndon Command Center alerted FAA headquarters that Flight 93 had crashed at 10.13. Needs called the Washington Air Route Traffic Control Center for an update on Flight 93 and received notification that the flight had crashed. At 10.37, CNN correspondent Aaron Brown, covering the collapse of the World Trade Center, announced, We are getting reports and we are getting lots of reports and we want to be careful to tell you when we have confirmed them and not, but we have a report that a 747 is down in Pennsylvania, and that remains unconfirmed at this point. He followed that up at 10.49 by reporting that, We have a report now that a large plane crashed this morning, north of the Somerset County Airport, which is in western Pennsylvania, not too terribly far from Pittsburgh, about 80 miles or so, a Boeing 767 jet. Don't know whose airline it was, whose airplane it was, and we don't have any details beyond that which I have just given you. Quote, in the confusion, he also erroneously reported a second hijacked plane heading for the Pentagon after the crash of the first. Topic. Aftermath Flight 93 fragmented violently upon impact. Most of the aircraft wreckage was found near the impact crater. Investigators found very light debris including paper and nylon scattered up to 8 miles 13 kilometers from the impact point in New Baltimore. Other tiny aircraft fragments were found 1.5 miles 2.4 kilometers away at Indian Lake. All human remains were found within a 70-acre area surrounding the impact point. Somerset County Coroner Wally Miller was involved in the investigation and identification of the remains. In examining the wreckage, the only human body part he could see was part of a backbone. Miller later found and identified 1,500 pieces of human remains totaling about 600 pounds 272 kilograms, or 8% of the total. The rest of the remains were consumed by the impact. Investigators identified four victims by September 22 and 11 by September 24. They identified another by September 29. 34 passengers were identified by October 27. All the people on board the flight were identified by December 21. 
Human remains were so fragmented that investigators could not determine whether any victims were dead before the plane crashed. Death certificates for the 40 victims listed the cause of death as homicide and listed the cause of death for the four hijackers as suicide. The remains and personal effects of the victims were returned to the families. The remains of the hijackers, identified by the process of elimination, were turned over to the Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI as evidence. Investigators also found a knife concealed in a cigarette lighter. They located the flight data recorder on September 13 and the cockpit voice recorder the following day. The voice recorder was found buried 25 feet 8 meters below the crater. The FBI initially refused to release the voice recording, rejecting requests by Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher and family members of those on board. They later allowed the relatives of the Flight 93 victims to listen to the recording in a closed session on April 18, 2002. Jurors for the Zakaria's Musawi trial heard the tape as part of the proceedings and the transcript was publicly released on April 12, 2006. All passengers and crew on board Flight 93 were nominated for the Congressional Gold Medal on September 19, 2001. Congressman Bill Shuster introduced a bill to this effect in 2006, and they were granted on September 11, 2014. Beamer's final words, Let's roll, became a national catchphrase. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey changed the name of Newark's airport from Newark International Airport to Newark Liberty International Airport, and a flag now flies over Terminal A's Gate A17. Flight 93 has been the subject of various films and documentaries including The Flight That Fought Back, Flight 93, and the feature film United 93. In keeping with standard airline practice after disasters, the flight number 93 was discontinued by United Airlines after the hijacking. United has many non-stop flights from Newark to San Francisco. As of May 2016, there is still an 8 a.m. flight from Newark to San Francisco, which still uses a Boeing 757, but it is now Flight 497. It was reported in May 2011 that United was reactivating flight numbers 93 and 175 as a codeshare operated by Continental, sparking an outcry from some in the media and the labor union representing United pilots. United said the reactivation was a mistake and said the numbers were inadvertently reinstated and would not be reactivated. Topic: <laughs> Possible targets. Since it never reached a target, the exact place intended to be hit by flight 93 has never been decisively confirmed. Before the attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Osama bin Laden, and Mohammed Atef developed a list of potential targets. Bin Laden wanted to destroy the White House and the Pentagon. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed wanted to strike the World Trade Center and all three wanted to hit the Capitol. No one else was involved in the initial selection of targets. Bin Laden told 9-11 planner Ramzi bin al-Sheib to advise Muhammad Atta that he preferred the White House over the Capitol as a target. Atta cautioned bin al-Sheib that this would be difficult, but agreed to include the White House as a possible target and suggested they keep the Capitol as an alternative in case the White House proved too difficult. Eventually, Atta told bin al-Sheib that Jarrah planned to hit the Capitol. Atta briefly mentioned the possibility of striking a nuclear facility, but balked after the other attack pilots voiced their opposition. Based on an exchange between Atta and bin al sheib two days before the attacks, the White House would be the primary target for the fourth plane and the capital the secondary target. 
If any pilot could not reach his intended target, he was to crash the plane. Immediately after the attacks, there was speculation that Camp David was the intended target. According to testimony by captured Al Qaeda member Abu Zubaydah, U.S. officials believed the White House was the intended target. A post 9 11 interview with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and bin Al Sheib by Al Jazeera reporter Yosri Foda stated that Flight 93 was heading for the capital. The 9 11 Commission report cited the actions of the crew and passengers in preventing the destruction of either the White House or the capital. According to further testimony by Sheikh Mohammed, bin Laden preferred the capital over the White House as a target. Salim Hamdan, bin Laden's driver, told interrogators that he knew the flight was heading for the capital. <laughs> Fighter jet response A fighter pilot based at Andrews Air Force Base, Billy Hutchison, claims that while in the air he spotted Flight 93 on his scope and planned to first fire his training rounds into the engine and cockpit, and then ram the airplane with his own jet. His account was published in Lynn Spencer's book Touching History. John Farmer, senior counsel to the 9-11 Commission, pointed out that this would have been impossible, as Hutchison's Air Andrews squadron was not in the air until 10.38, almost 30 minutes after Flight 93 had crashed. When the 9-11 Commission asked Hutchison why he gave this false claim he refused to give an answer and stormed out of the room. Two F-16 fighter pilots from the 121st Fighter Squadron of the DC Air National Guard, Mark Sassville and Heather Lucky Penny, were scrambled and ordered to intercept Flight 93. The pilots intended to ram it since they did not have time to arm the jets, this was in the days before armed jets stood ready to take off at a moment's notice to protect the capital's airspace. They never reached Flight 93 and did not learn of its crash until hours afterwards. The North American Aerospace Defense Command (NORAD) stated to the 9/11 Commission that fighters would have intercepted Flight 93 before it reached its target in Washington D.C., but the commission disagreed, stating that NORAD did not even know the plane was hijacked until after it had crashed and concluding that had it not crashed it probably would have arrived in Washington by 1023. The 9-11 Commission report stated that NEEDS fighters pursued Delta Air Lines Flight 1989, a flight thought to be hijacked. The Commission found that NORAD and the FAA gave inaccurate testimony. Memorials. <inaudible> 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 A temporary memorial formed from spontaneous tributes left by visitors in the days after the attacks at the crash site. Foundations across the country began to raise money to fund a memorial to the victims within a month of the crash. Two years after the attacks, federal officials formed the Flight 93 National Memorial Advisory Commission responsible for making design recommendations for a permanent memorial. A national design competition was held to create a public memorial in the Pennsylvania field where Flight 93 crashed. The winning design, Crescent of Embrace, was selected out of a pool of 1,011 submissions on September 7, 2005. The site plan features a large crescent pathway with red maples and sugar maples planted along the outer arc. This design ran into opposition over funding, size, and appearance. Republican Congressman Charles H. Taylor blocked $10 million in federal funds toward the project as he saw it as unrealistic. Republican congressional leaders later persuaded him to acquiesce to political pressure and began approving federal funds. The proposed design has also attracted critics who see Islamic symbolism in the crescent design. 
On August 31, 2009, an agreement was announced between the landowners and the National Park Service to allow the purchase of land for $9.5 million. The memorial area with a white marble wall of names was dedicated on September 10, 2011, the day before the 10th anniversary of the crash. A concrete and glass visitor center was opened on September 10, 2015 on a hill overlooking the memorial, with both the visitor center and the wall of names being aligned with the flight path and the final piece, the Tower of Voices was dedicated during a ceremony on September 9, 2018. C. C. Lyles was one of the flight attendants on board. In 2003, a statue of Lyles was unveiled in her hometown of Fort Pierce, Florida, which has since gained national recognition as one of the many monuments to the attacks. On August 9, 2007, a portion of US-219 in Somerset County, near the Flight 93 National Memorial, was co-signed as the Flight 93 Memorial Highway. At the National September 11 Memorial, the names of the 40 victims of Flight 93 are inscribed on panels S67 and S68 at the South Pool. On September 11, 2017, the 16th anniversary of the crash, Vice President Mike Pence spoke at the memorial to a gathering of relatives and friends of the victims. Pence, a member of Congress on the date of the crash, stated that the victims may have saved his life. Learning that the Capitol was a possible target of the hijacked plane and only 12 minutes away by air, he said, it was the longest 12 minutes of my life. Without regard to personal safety, they the victims rushed forward to save lives. I will always believe that I and many others in our nation's capital were able to go home that day and hug our families because of the courage and sacrifice of the heroes of Flight 93. <laughs> <laughs> Nationalities of the passengers Note, this list does not include the nationalities of the four hijackers of the plane. Topic. See also The Flight That Fought Back September 11, 2005 on Discovery Channel United 93 Film, a 2006 biographical drama thriller film written, co-produced and directed by Paul Greengrass, that chronicles events aboard the flight. <laughs>